talk on a very important issue in our country's international affairs. The U.S. relationship with Canada is based on deep friendship, shared values and institutions, and a host of mutual interests. It's my privilege to welcome to IPFW today Dr. Roy B. Norton, Consul General of Canada based in Detroit. Before I introduce Dr. Norton, let me thank a few people and offices who made this visit possible. Thanks first to Dennis Moore, Public Affairs Officer at the Detroit Consulate for contacting us in the first place. Thanks to the American Democracy Project and the Mike Down Center for International Politics. <laughs> I guess that would be Indiana politics uh, for sponsoring and helping to arrange the talk. And thanks to uh, CATV for recording the talk and to MDON for making it available via the internet. For those of you interested in learning more about international affairs, I'd like to point out that IPFW offers all sorts of opportunities to do so. Many of our departments, including my own political science department, offer courses on international subjects. And the university also offers a popular certificate program in international studies. In our highly globalized and increasingly interconnected world, knowledge of other countries, other cultures, other languages, and international affairs at large matters more than it ever did. Canada is a country of great importance to the United States. It's a close strategic ally, a fellow democracy, and our largest trading partner. One thing that I learned in, in preparing these remarks is the vital importance of Canada to Indiana's economy in particular. Canada is Indiana's largest export market. We sell more goods to Canada than we do to our next seven largest foreign markets combined. It's all too easy, I think, given the number of crises that we try to follow and learn about in countries around the world, to take for granted one of our closest international friendships. Americans should learn more about Canada than we do. Roy Norton graduated from Carleton University in Ottawa and then went on to earn additional master's degrees from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and from uh, CITES, the Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. He also earned a PhD in international relations from SAIS. Having worked in various positions in Canada's parliament and foreign ministry, he most recently served as Minister for Congressional, Public, and Intergovernmental Relations at the Canadian Embassy in Washington. As Consul General in Detroit, he is responsible for promoting Canadian economic and cultural interests in Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Norton to IPFW. Thank you. Thanks. Professor Toole, thank you for that. And Professor Downs, thank you for uh, being our point of outreach in the first instance and for arranging this. Um, your, your slip there, Professor Toole, um, caused me some amusement because I'm given to believe that at IPFW uh, there is no distinction between international politics and Indiana politics, um, the, that there's a seamlessness, as it were, um, and um, it's fun to be, uh, to be at such a place that places a premium on politics, whether it's with regard to the state or the country or the intersection, as it were, between the two. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be with you. I'm flattered at the invitation. Uh, this is part of Canada Week in Indiana. You may not have been aware of that. You probably haven't seen any television advertisements to the effect that it's Canada Week in Indiana. It's Canada Week because I'm here. And I declared it. To, if I'm spending a week in Indiana, it's going to be Canada Week in Indiana. It started with... Um, with um, uh, South Bend. I've been speaking to chambers of commerce and to universities. In the case of universities, the University of Notre Dame, Purdue, on Tuesday in Lafayette. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Indiana University in Bloomington. Got a bit of a drive tonight. Um, and um, some chambers in, um, in St. Joseph County, South Bend. Um, in Lafayette uh, in Indianapolis, uh, today uh, in both Warsaw uh, very early this morning and uh, at noon uh, here in Fort Wayne and tomorrow in Bloomington and then concluding with an event tomorrow night in Indianapolis when we host um, a number of prominent Hoosiers at an event in conjunction with the Canadian 
uh, creative uh, uh, circus company without animals, Cirque du Soleil, is doing Michael Jackson, the Immortal World Tour, uh, appropriately enough, given that Michael Jackson comes from Indiana, uh, a blending, as it were, just like Indiana and international politics, a blending of Canada and Indiana right here in, um, in, uh, in Indiana, uh, in, in, in Indianapolis tomorrow night. Um, this is um, a history presentation in some respects. Uh, I, in the first instance, uh, studied uh, Canadian history, uh, have a love of it, um, a love of many things. That's, I never really settled upon one thing, and I like the opportunity to indulge that love and to talk about, about in this case, the history of the U.S.-Canada relationship uh, because it's a long one for obvious reasons and, um, and one that's very important to us. We think very important to you too, if not necessarily top of mind for all Americans. Uh, Canada, for that matter, is rarely top of mind for Americans. It's a relationship that's enormous, it's profound. Um, we're obsessed with you in a way that you aren't obsessed with us. You've got lots of things to worry about in international relations, to say nothing of what you worry about in Indiana politics. And, um, and we're not bothered at the fact that Canada isn't top of mind, but my job as Consul General is to try to increase the profile to the extent possible, and that's why I'm spending Canada Week in Indiana uh, with folks to, um, to try to um, make them a little bit more aware of the opportunities that associate with, um, with this enormous relationship that exists. Relative to much, indeed most of the world, um, the U.S. and Canada are both young countries, um, comparatively speaking. Your history as a nation began in revolution against the United Kingdom 236 years ago this year. And 200 years ago this coming June, you declared war on the United Kingdom, effectively on us. Um, the War of 1812-14 to 14, was fought exclusively in North America. A war was declared on the United Kingdom, but fought only in North America. That war forged a Canadian identity, if not yet a country. That didn't happen in Canada for another 55 years. For you, the war cleared the path for settlement of the upper Midwest, including, of course, Indiana. Histories of the US-Canada relationship, at least those that are written in Canada are replete with metaphors of elephants, that's you, uh, and mice, that's us, sharing a continent. Uh, you catch a cold, we get pneumonia. You roll over, you get the picture. Um, uh, from the Canadian perspective, almost everything about our development has happened in recognition of the US reality. In this, we led the rest of the world really by easily 100 years. Uh, decisions taken here in the United States affected Canada uh, long before the U.S. became the world superpower. And I must assure you, Canadians wouldn't have it any other way. Um, we wouldn't want to be anywhere else on the planet aside from where we are. We are very glad it's with you that we share uh, the world's longest border, more than 5,000 miles. Um, we're very glad that it's with you that we've been able to develop and secure this continent. When I say you, for what it's worth, I mean Americans, even though I understand that at least uh, one of us uh, here, another of us here today is a Canadian. Um, so the we, they is, uh, is not to be taken in any context beyond that. I've titled this um, presentation, uh, The First 235 Years of U.S.-Canada Relations in Less Than an Hour. Um, Obviously, we anticipate another 235 years and yet another after that. I should say at this point that if you aren't in the habit of attending, or for those of you that will be viewing this, uh, watching uh, history-based lectures, to the extent to which this presentation is occasioned by the 200th anniversary this year of the War of 1812, you're not likely to have to do this for another 100 years. And so uh, sit back and make yourselves comfortable. Generations of Canadians came to regard my country, Canada, as the peaceable kingdom. We Canadians do a lot of comparing and contrasting. I'll let you guess who it is as the perennial benchmark uh, in that exercise. Uh, of course, in the 1770s, residents of the 13 colonies regarded Quebec, which included this very spot, as anything but peaceable. Your Declaration of Independence sought 
life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and it was from us, my British ancestors, that you were seeking liberty. It's a measure of the essential pragmatism of our populations that we've been able to have a relationship at all during the ensuing 235 years, let alone such a productive one. The Treaty of Paris of 1783 ended the Revolutionary War, but as you uh, will recall from history, some issues lingered. The Jay Treaty of 1795 largely resolved those, but some suspicions did linger. Pulitzer Prize winner Alan Taylor's magisterial book, The Civil War of 1812, American Citizens, British Subjects, Irish Rebels, and Indian Allies, chronicles what happened next to the relationship. The War of 1812 was formative for Canadians in many of the same ways that the Revolutionary War was for Americans. Outnumbered in population 10 to 1, we fought you to a draw. You burned our capital at York, now Toronto. We burned the White House. In the Treaty of Ghent of 1814, the peace treaty that ended the War of 1812, Britain es essentially relinquished the territorial gains that it had made during the course of the progress of the war. So did the United States. Canadians learned something in that process about the colonial power, uh, the United Kingdom, which was of course then still the world superpower, and about national interest. The geopolitical priority of good relations with the United States was as important then to, the, um, to Britain uh, as it is now to all of us, certainly uh, to Canada. This recurring theme, placing a priority on good relations with the United States, has underpinned the ensuing 200 plus years of our shared history. President Monroe's 1823 doctrine stating that further efforts by European countries to colonize land or interfere with countries in the Americas would be viewed as acts of aggression requiring US intervention may or may not have been formulated with the northern part of the continent in mind. But it certainly engendered fears in Canada. Would relations between our jurisdictions henceforth be conducted under the guise of America's desire for hemispheric hegemony? The specter of another possible US invasion certainly motivated the construction between 1826 and 1832 of the 100 mile long Rideau Canal system connecting Lake Ontario to what would later become Canada's capital of Ottawa. During winter, when the six miles of the canal that uh, run through central Ottawa, now central Ottawa, are converted today to the world's longest skating rink, residents could usefully reflect on how grateful they should be to the perceived threat of another US invasion. And the advent of US Manifest Destiny in the 1840s and its use to justify the 1846 war with Mexico did nothing to allay Canadian perceptions of vulnerability. Canadian business interests, meanwhile, were growing in their recognition that the United States going forward likely constituted a more natural and probably more profitable market than did the United Kingdom itself. In 1854, a treaty of reciprocity was signed between the British North American colonies and the United States, with each side removing duties on a lengthy list of mostly agricultural products and natural resources. Reciprocal access was provided quite extensively to North American fisheries. British and American shipping had access upon equal terms to the St. Lawrence River, the Canadian canals, and to Lake Michigan. Trade more than doubled over the next 10 years. Whether precisely as a result of the Reciprocity Treaty, however, we'll never know for sure. The region was booming at the time. Railways were being constructed in the US Midwest, and of course there was the huge demand created by your civil war. Some accuse Britain of having been an ambivalent observer during that war, or maybe even worse. That can't be said of Canada. We were regarded by both sides as potential guns for hire. But overwhelmingly, Canadians fought on the Union side, perhaps as many as 50,000 of us. Notwithstanding lingering suspicions about the Republic and its intentions, Canadians were drawn to the cause of individual liberty. It is estimated that as many as 100,000 American slaves had fled via the Underground Railroad to Canada in the decade from 1850 to 1860. 
with the principal destination being Windsor, the city at the other end of the Ambassador Bridge connecting to Detroit. Ironically, as demand and business opportunity grew, U.S. companies became more protectionist. The U.S. government abrogated the 1854 Reciprocity Treaty in 1866. Apprehension that the victorious Union Army might decide to turn its attentions northward, exacerbated by raids on several Canadian locations in 1866 by the Fenians, a group of radical Irish Americans centered in New York, provoked another bout of Canadian fear and introspection. After 80 years of recurring paranoia, this time, however, we decided actually to form a country. And so in 1867, the provinces of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia came together, still under British sovereignty, and created the Dominion of Canada. The rallying cry was not, however, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Rather, it was the Canadian counterpart enshrined in the British North America Act of 1867, which remained our constitution until just 29 years ago, is peace, order and good government. It is just possible that in those two alternative phrases, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and peace, order, and good government, you can derive much of what you need to know about the differences between Canadian and American thinking. It worked. Perhaps due to the prowess we then projected as a unified geography, or maybe due to exhaustion and your need to be preoccupied with reconstruction, you didn't turn around and invade Canada. Canadian Confederation, causally or coincidentally, we can't be sure, pretty much marks the point at which Canada's relations with the United States no longer were driven by fear that Canada might have to fight a defensive war for national survival. The other recurring theme during these 235 years, the extent to which the, the two governments would facilitate or constrain economic relations between the two countries, was in no way resolved in the mid-1860s. Notwithstanding the 1854 Reciprocity Treaty, disputes erupted with some frequency between the United States and Canada, especially pertaining to fisheries. In fact, there's rarely been a time in our history since U.S. independence, when there has not been a fisheries dispute of greater or lesser magnitude. Hardly surprising, given the vast coastal and inland waters that we share and the difficulty in drawing and agreeing on boundaries. Parenthetically, we have a small handful of lingering boundary disputes to this very day, the largest being over an area the size of Connecticut in the Beaufort Sea northeast of Alaska. With abrogation of the Reciprocity Treaty in 1866, the option of closer economic relations between the two countries was effectively taken off the table, at least for the time being. So the attentions of the newly formed nation of Canada turned westward. In this, we acted very much as the United States had and was doing. Each of us had other fish to fry, so to speak. The opportunity of westward expansion, in a sense, was a welcome distraction for both of us. In Canada's case, settling the West also had a defensive element. If you settled your West, and we didn't, the specter of American northward movement might rear its head again. And so, during the last decades of the 19th century and the first of the 20th, Canada embarked on a period of national consolidation. In 1879, uh, Sir John A. Macdonald's government, Mac Macdonald was Canada's first Prime Minister, serving for 19 years between 1867 and 19, uh, or 1891, um, introduced his so-called national policy. It was a policy with three pillars, building the transcontinental railway, the Canadian Pacific Railway, which of course exists to this day, attracting immigrants to settle the West, and thirdly, protection of infant Canadian industries with high tariffs. Although the concept of free trade with the United States was periodically debated over the years, it wasn't central to a Canadian election campaign until 1911 when the government of Sir Wilfrid Laurier, our first Quebec Prime Minister, was resoundingly defeated after advocating free trade. It would be another 75 years before a Prime Minister was willing to touch this third rail of Canadian politics. That free trade election of 1911 came just two years after the conclusion of the Boundary Waters Treaty, which created the International Joint Commission. 
you should not infer from this any Canadian schizophrenia. It's possible on the one hand to worry that in a free trade relationship with a country 13 times as populous as yours, your industry might flee, while on the other hand being pragmatically disposed to binational arrangements of equality, in this case re re regulating boundary waters in the mutual interests of the two countries. Absolutely key to the success of the International Joint Commission model from Canada's perspective is that it is an institution in which there is no asymmetric power relationship. The U.S. and Canada enjoy equal weight. The biennial meeting, uh, the most recent one, took place in Detroit just this October for the first time ever in conjunction with the annual meetings of two other binational fora that also focus on the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes Commission and the Healing Our Waters Coalition. Back to my chronology. Great Britain entered World War I on August 4th, 1914. Canada one day later. The U.S. posture of neutrality ended in April of 1917 with Congress's declaration of war. World War I changed many things for Canada. On one level, it represented another coming of age. With a population at the time one thirteenth that of the United States', Canada suffered more than half as many military deaths as did the United States. I'm not speaking in proportionate terms, I'm speaking in absolute number terms. Convinced on the battlefields of Europe and the seas around it that Canada had transitioned from colony to nation, Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden, the Canadian Prime Minister at the time, insisted on and won a separate seat at the Paris Peace Conference. This came in spite of initial US opposition. You thought we would be just another British vote at the conference. World War I was about much more than countries coming of age, however. It also represented a changing of the guard, with the United States becoming arguably at that time the world's true superpower. Canadian Prime Ministers from World War I onwards paid much more attention to the United States than they did from that point forward to the United Kingdom. This constituted a real change. Not yet formally responsible for our own international relations, Canada nonetheless, which th that happened in 1931 with the Statute of Westminster, um, Canada nonetheless opened its first diplomatic office abroad, a, leg a legation office in Washington in 1926, and the United States reciprocated the same year, opening an office in my hometown of Ottawa, Canada. The 1920s were a period of post-war prosperity in both countries. In yours, of course, it was also the time of prohibition. From 1920 to 1933, Canadians honed a capacity to provide quick and quality response to American commercial needs. Mackenzie King, who was the longest serving Canadian Prime Minister in our history, was a Harvard PhD, unlike previous Prime Ministers who had generally been educated in Great Britain. King was the Prime Minister from 1921 through 1940. Nine with a five-year, uh, six-year gap. King personified the shift in Canada's mindset. His time in office closely overlapped that of your longest-serving president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The two worked extremely closely together. King embraced many of FDR's New Deal policies to combat the Great Depression in Canada, and they collaborated tightly in prosecuting World War II. As in the case of the first Gulf War, the first Great War rather, we'll get to the Gulf War later, Canada entered early. Again, Canada was on the battlefield and the high seas more than two years before the United States entered. But barely months into the war and well before Pearl Harbor, fears grew, including in Canada, that Britain could fall to the Nazis. Prime Minister King wasn't alone in projecting that Canada might then have become the next target. He met with President Roosevelt at Ogdensburg, New York, on the St. Lawrence Seaway in August of 1940. There they announced the creation of the Permanent Joint Board on Defense, a body that in its permanence obviously was being created to outlast the crisis represented by World War II. That agreement put in place much closer Canadian-American military cooperation than had previously pertained. The board became the senior advisory body on continental security. It exists to this day and comprises two national sections made up of diplomatic and military representatives. 
Quebec City provided the venue in August of 1943 for a highly secret military conference codenamed Quadrant uh, between the British, U.S. and Canadian governments. President uh, Roosevelt, Prime Minister Churchill and Prime Minister King represented their respective countries. Planning began, began there for the invasion of France, codenamed, codenamed Overlord. There was discussion of increased bombing of Germany and of the buildup of U.S. forces in Britain prior to an invasion of France. So aligned did our countries emerge, Canada and the United States, from World War II, that President Truman's observation in 1947 to the effect that, quote, Canada and the United States have now reached the point where we can no longer think of each other as foreign countries, apparently failed to offend even resolute Canadian nationalists, those who perennially define Canadian identity in relation to the United States. Seeds of U.S.-Canada defense cooperation that blossomed during World War II led directly to full Canadian participation in the creation of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and in 1949, and NORAD, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, headquartered in Colorado Springs, in 1958, the latter probably being the most important military agreement of which Canada is part. Our two countries fought alongside one another in Korea on the UN force during that war, further cementing military bounds bonds. And these bonds have only grown since. There are four countries with which the United States is comfortable sharing almost all intelligence and the status of military planning, Canada foremost among them. And we continue to turn to the United States to meet most of our major defense procurement needs. John F. Kennedy, your new articulate young president, came to Ottawa in 1961 and spoke to our parliament. There he pronounced on the U.S.-Canada relationship, and I quote, those whom nature hath so joined together, let no man put asunder. Uh, this notwithstanding the fact that the government of his Canadian counterpart, John Diefenbaker, would drive the U.S. to distraction through indecision on whether to allow U.S. nuclear weapons on Canadian soil. Relations post-Diefenbaker, he was replaced by Lester Pearson, a Nobel uh, Peace Prize winner, uh, former Canadian foreign minister in 1963 as prime minister, and relations improved for a time with Pearson's election uh, to office in 1963. However, Vietnam did prove a challenge. Despite official U.S. requests, Canada did not enter that war, although more than 5,000 Canadians enlisted in the U.S. military in order to fight. In fact, Prime Minister Pearson took the extraordinary step during a speech at Philadelphia's Temple University in April of 1965 of voicing his support for a pause in U.S. bombing of North Vietnam so that a diplomatic solution to the crisis might ensue. The Johnson administration erupted. Even before Pearson was finished giving his speech, he was summoned the next day to Camp David for a meeting with President Johnson. Now, President Johnson, as you may recall, was well known for his earthiness. On greeting Pearson, he reportedly grabbed Pearson's lapels and said, don't you come into my living room and piss on my rug. Um, only twice today am I being a bit risque in my choice of language, but both times I'm quoting U.S. presidents, and so it would seem to me that that makes it all right, eh? Um, the two, Pearson and Johnson, worked hard to repair the relationship. Generously, President Johnson helped open the World's Fair in Montreal in 1967, saying, and I quote, we of the United States consider ourselves blessed. We have so much to give thanks for. But the gift of providence we cherish most is that we were given as our neighbors on this wonderful continent, the people and the nation of Canada. In this, he laid the groundwork for the pronouncement on October 18th last year by the USA's current ambassador to Canada, David Jacobson, who said, quote, I am here to tell you that the United States is unbelievably lucky to have Canada as our neighbor. Now, Canadian diplomats, of course, could say none of this. At least we could originate none of it. But we love it when we can quote Americans who do. Vietnam was seminal in shaping the individual attitudes of many Canadians towards the United States. An estimated 30,000 or more resistors of the U.S. draft 
had taken up residence in Canada, many achieved positions of prominence, including in the Canadian media, sharing thereafter with Canadian audiences their perceptions of American leadership and of its role in the world. Some of you may remember Pierre Trudeau. He was Canada's third longest serving Prime Minister, more than 15 years. We don't have a restriction on the amount of time our leaders can serve. Um, uh, more than 15 years between 1968 and 1984. It's likely the case that neither Trudeau nor Richard Nixon was inherently inclined to warm to the other. They held substantially different world views. Trudeau disagreed with U.S. Cold War policies. At a press conference in 1971, he opined that the United States posed, I'm quoting, a danger to our, meaning Canadian, national identity from a cultural, economic, and perhaps even military point of view. Subsequently, President Nixon was quoted referring to Pierre Trudeau as that asshole. That's number two of two. <laughs> to which Trudeau replied, I've been called worse things by better people. <laughs> Nixon nonetheless came to Canada the next year at Trudeau's invitation. He spoke to Parliament in Ottawa and declared the vaunted special relationship between Canada and the United States to be dead. He said, it is time for us to recognize that we have very separate identities, that we have significant differences, and that nobody's interests are furthered when these realities are obscured. It's important to emphasize here that even when the personal relationship between U.S. and Canadian leaders wasn't at its very best, business nonetheless got done. There simply are too many things to manage when you share a continent. And so during the visit in which President Nixon made his remarks to Parliament, he and Prime Minister Trudeau signed the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. That agreement, which was updated again in 1987 and, and is about to be revised and renewed again, has contributed significantly to the revival of the Great Lakes, probably most notably Lake Erie. Uh, the the uh, proximate cause, in a sense, for, for the agreement was that the Cuyahoga River uh, flowing into Lake Erie through Cleveland perennially caught on fire in the 1950s and 60s. That's how polluted it was, and it was deemed that something should be done. And so the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement emerged. Um, its existence is but one measure of the determination and the ability of America's and, Canadians gov and Canada's governments to uh, engage in practical problem solving, even during those times that leaders aren't especially friendly with one another. However, things did get better. Thank God for Gerald Ford. Your 38th president knew Canada well, having traveled um, to my country many times. It would appear that he was much more relaxed about Pierre Trudeau than what Richard Nixon had been. And with the benefit of six years in office, perhaps Trudeau by that time was less inclined to gratuitous provocation of the United States. The first G5 summit, the United States, Japan, Germany, the United Kingdom and France, took place in France in 1975. President Giscard of France invited Italy to attend, although it was not officially a member. President Ford reportedly was irate at Canada's exclusion. Giscard reportedly was adamant on the subject. The U.S. hosted the second summit the next year. Ford invited uh, Trudeau. From that point forward, the G5 became the G7, with Italy and Canada both formal members. Hark back for a moment to the post-World War II Paris, post-World War I Paris Peace Conference. The U.S. didn't want Canada there. In 1975, the French didn't want Canada to be a G-whatever member, likely convinced that we would be just another U.S. vote. The British secured our participation at Paris. President Ford secured Canadian membership in the G7 from 1976 onwards. Our orbital migration as a country was complete. A personal aside, I was minister at the Canadian Embassy in Washington responsible for congressional relations and public affairs, among other things, when President Ford died on the day after Christmas in 2006. If you've ever been to our embassy, you know that we're very well located on Pennsylvania Avenue at the foot of Capitol Hill, right across from the west wing of the National Gallery. Uh, we quickly commissioned a banner to cover the Pennsylvania Avenue side wall of the embassy, paying tribute to Gerald Ford and the relations Canada enjoyed during the USA, with the USA during his presidency. Now, arguably, Gerald Ford 
was the only U.S. president with whom Prime Minister Trudeau actually did get along. President Carter, Ford's successor, was the only elected U.S. president since before the Great Depression not to visit Canada while he was in office. In other words, this isn't about partisanship. Jimmy Carter evidently found Pierre Trudeau's lecturing on the, uh, the United States on its management of the free world to be as irritating as Richard Nixon had and as Ronald Reagan would. But Trudeau had been replaced briefly, coincident with President Carter's greatest foreign policy crisis, the seizure by Iranian radicals of the U.S. Embassy in Tehran on October 4th of 1979. Several U.S. diplomats and their spouses managed to escape that day to the Canadian Embassy. We secluded them there for almost three months, equipping them with Canadian identities and passports, which made it possible for them to board a plane at the end of January of 1980 to Switzerland. This operation, which obviously involved great personal risk to everyone on the ground, was overseen by Canada's first female foreign minister, the Honourable Flora Macdonald, and by my former boss, then Prime Minister Joe Clark. Clark, like Brian Mulroney, who became our Prime Minister in 1984, had fought his election in 1979 against Pierre Trudeau on the issue of the need to restore good relations with the United States. This theme often recurs in Canadian campaigns. I'll reference it again. The final Trudeau term corresponded with President Reagan's first. There was little chemistry between the two leaders, a vast ideological gulf separated them. Canadian public opinion undoubtedly reinforced Pierre Trudeau's personal opinions, making him less disposed to try to solve issues that might have required compromise on his part. This phenomenon also is a recurring one. Prime Minister Chrétien, uh, who came to office in 1993 and served until 2004, likely found it easier to reverse himself on his 1993 campaign opposition to NAFTA because it was Bill Clinton in the end who was asking him to do so. Canadians, you see, loved Bill Clinton. But before there was a NAFTA, which took effect in 1994, there was a U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, which took effect in 1989. And before there was a Prime Minister Chrétien, there was a Prime Minister Mulroney. He, Mulroney, campaigned hard in 1984 in support of an improved relationship with the United States. As I said uh, before, our relations with you periodically feature prominently in Canadian election campaigns. I think I'm glad that the reverse is not true. Pierre Trudeau had alienated American leaders in so many ways. Canadians concluded that we paid a heavy price for his anti-American indulgences. Brian Mulroney won a smashing victory in that election, winning more seats in Parliament than any uh, elected Prime Minister in Canadian history. Mulroney was a businessman. For six years prior to becoming, le becoming leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, as it was then known, he had been president of the Iron Ore Company of Canada, a subsidiary of a U.S. multinational. He was a deal maker, and he never met anyone whom he could not charm, including Ronald Reagan. In March of 1985, Reagan visited Canada, Quebec City, in fact, on St. Patrick's Day, no less. There, the two leaders, both of Irish descent, held what came to be known as the Shamrock Summit. On stage, in front of the media, arm in arm, they sang, When Irish Eyes Are Smiling. Canadians who had voted for an improved relationship with the United States certainly got what they wanted, and quickly at that. Beginning in 1985, and for the remaining years of the Reagan presidency, Mulroney tried to secure from the United States an agreement on acid rain abatement, the phenomenon whereby emissions from industry, principally from coal-fired electricity generation, located disproportionately in the industrial Midwest, traveled north and east via prevailing winds, and then were brought back to, uh, to uh, land or lakes uh, via precipitation, uh, acidifying and destroying both forests and lakes in central Canada and the eastern United States. President Reagan would have none of it. The science didn't support the theory, it was asserted. It took the advent of President George H.W. Bush to secure an agreement. As a result, the problem has largely been mitigated. Historically, overt pursuit of good relations with the United States has, in my view, um, this is not universally held, but it's widely held, actually has enhanced Canada's scope to disagree with the United States on some important foreign policy issues of the day. 
So, for example, Brian Mulroney and his foreign minister, Joe Clark, were global leaders in the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. In that, they found themselves on opposite sides from both Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. And Clark threw himself into the Central American peace process, an issue on which, again, Canada found itself at odds with the United States. Full disclosure, I was Clark's senior policy advisor at the time. Uh, South Africa and Central America were among my files, so to speak. The key point for our purposes today, though, is that because no U.S. diplomat posted in Canada at the time could honestly have reported that the Mulroney government was disagreeing with the United States on these issues simply for the domestic political benefits in Canada of needling the superpower, and there are some, um, something Pierre Trudeau was often accused of doing, Canada paid no evident price insofar as its relations with the U.S. were concerned for its pursuit of a different policy than the Americans were taking internationally. On the single issue that came to define the Mulroney government's relationship with the United States, pursuit of a free trade agreement, the Prime Minister's warm personal relations with the President and other key members of the administration were instrumental in overcoming both the inertia and skepticism with which official Washington often confronts opportunities like that one. A little background. Under Lester Pearson and Lyndon Baines Johnson, Canada and the United States had entered into what uh, became known as the Auto Pact, the Automotive Pact. Fortunately, this, this was signed a few months before the infamous Temple University speech. The pact greatly benefited the large American car makers as well as Canadian automakers. The Auto Pact worked well for both countries. In Canada, it became Exhibit A as to why free trade with the United States should be considered non-threatening. The Central Canadian Automotive Assembly and parts manufacturing business blossomed. In 2010, and in fact most years in recent memory, more vehicles were assembled in Ontario, Canada than in Michigan or in any other North American jurisdiction. Now I know well where I stand at this instant, um, Indiana is a major automobile manufacturer. You shouldn't be, feel threatened by that statistic. Approximately 60% of the major content powertrains and the like, of every vehicle coming off the assembly line in Canada is in fact American. It's a fine illustration of how fully integrated our economies, especially in that sector, have become. Mulroney decided in 1985 to take the free trade plunge and confront that aforementioned third rail of Canadian politics. A free trade agreement with the United States became for Canadians what I should say, what NAFTA later became for the United States, a cosmic initiative. In relative terms, NAFTA uh, was a yawn in Canada. Three years of hard negotiations ensued, frequently coming close to failure. The agreement, once reached in 1988, won approval by the Canadian Parliament and the U.S. Congress. The much improved Canada-U.S. relationship that this reflected extended through the administration's of George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Brian Mulroney's role in building the coalition in support of the first Gulf War cannot be exaggerated. Not only did Canada contribute in an outsized fashion militarily, but the Prime Minister won the encouragement and support of President, with the encouragement and, pres, uh, and support of President Bush, spent a lot of time on the phone talking to leaders with whom he, Mulroney, may have had a stronger rapport than did President Bush. The modern-day bilingual, meaning English-French, capability of Canadian Prime Ministers proved to be an asset. The Prime Minister was instrumental in impressing on a skeptical French President Mitterrand the importance of a unified effort. France, of course, carries a veto at the UN Security Council, and partly at Canada's urging, the US had decided to go the Security Council route in terms of securing authorization for that war. Venezuela was a temporary member of the UN Security Council at the time. Then, if perhaps not as much as now, Venezuela was disinclined to line up behind US leadership. But working together on Haiti with Carlos Andres Pérez, the then president of Venezuela, Mulroney had developed an extremely close relationship with the Venezuelans, and he was able to parlay that into Venezuelan acquiescence in the Gulf War. Two countries, in other words, worked very closely together in support of what was a major strategic U.S. objective at the time, Canada, I think, contributing significantly on many different levels. 
also contributing to Canadian influence at the time, apart from our membership in the Commonwealth and La Francophonie, two multilateral organizations which by definition the United States cannot be part of, um, was the fact that in 1989, for the first time ever, Canada became a member of the Organization of American States. Previous Canadian governments had been paralyzed by fear that if we joined the OAS and echoed the U.S. position there, we would undermine our standing uh, elsewhere in the hemisphere with other member countries. And conversely, that if a member of the OAS and we disagreed with the U.S. position, we could jeopardize our critical bilateral relationship. Mulroney and Clark believed that Canada could walk and chew gum at the same time. They were confident in our relations with the United States and they felt that it was time to rectify the anomaly whereby Canada, the largest country geographically in the hemisphere, wasn't a member of the hemisphere's political organization. In this hemisphere and elsewhere, it has normally been to Canada's advantage that we are perceived as enjoying good relations with the United States. It's generally assumed worldwide that we, the US and Canada, are close. When it's evident that we aren't, as was the case for much of the Trudeau era and for a few years under Prime Ministers Chrétien and Martin, his successor, our standing elsewhere in the world suffers. Again, my theory. The go-between and interpreter roles that Canada often plays can be beneficial to the United States, to Canada, and to third countries. It, dis it disadvantages all parties when we take ourselves out of the position to discharge those functions. Canadian electors, while perhaps impressed by the influence that Prime Minister Mulroney seemed able to exert on global developments, nonetheless also place a considerable premium on independence from the United States. That is, any Canadian Prime Minister or party that is perceived to have become too close to the United States is usually punished. Brian Mulroney retired in June of 1993. Opposition leader Jean Chrétien was provoked to promise during the campaign that unlike Mulroney, he would not be going fishing with the U.S. president. This is something that Mulroney and George H.W. Bush had routinely done. Canadians embraced the distance from the U.S. that Chrétien offered. He was elected, he Chrétien, with a solid majority and when instead of fishing, he became a frequent golfing partner of President Clinton, Canadians seemed not to notice. The warmth of the, because again, Canadians liked Bill Clinton. Um, the warmth of the Chrétien-Clinton relationship, however, did not extend to President George W. Bush. Prime Minister Chrétien's government, indeed all Canadians, found stunning the rapidity with which the U.S.-Canada border seized up after 9-11. An efficiently operating border with the United States is critical to Canada's viability as a nation. Canadians died in the World Trade Center. The Canadian deputy commander at NORAD in Colorado Springs, um, always a Canadian deputy commander, happened to be in charge that day because the UN commander was away. So he, the Canadian, was responsible for bringing down air traffic across North America in the wake of the attacks. More than 230 US bound planes were landed in Canada. It was felt they couldn't come into the United States because people didn't know what the intentions of, uh, of these planes or the people driving them at the instant might be. Nonetheless, they were welcomed in Canada because otherwise calamity would have ensued. Um, Canadian communities, sometimes um, uh, Gander, Newfoundland, for example, which has a population of, uh, of 9,000, housed 6,000 US bound passengers for uh, some days without any particular tourist infrastructure. A lot of very close relationships were developed between US bound passengers, most of whom were American, and Canadians during that period of time. Like you, we felt vulnerable after 9-11, but not particularly to an attack from the United States. Most Canadians had trouble understanding why Americans felt sufficiently vulnerable to an attack from Canadian soil to warrant seizing up the border between us. Truck traffic and passenger traffic headed into the United States via the Ambassador Bridge, which by itself carries a quarter of all US-Canada trade. Uh, literally the world's most important border crossing was backed up 80 miles on the Canadian side of the bridge. Canadians were bothered by the totally unfounded assertions uttered then and repeated by some since that, I stress unfounded, totally so, that some of the hijackers came to Canada, came to the United States from our country. 
1938, when President Roosevelt had inaugurated the Thousand Islands Bridge between Ontario and New York State, he said, quote, this bridge stands as an open door. There will be no challenge at the border and no guard to ask a countersign. Where the boundary is crossed, the entry words must be pass friend. After 9-11, Canadians instinctively knew that pass friend was no longer practicable. And we responded pragmatically. The government proposed to the Bush administration a suite of measures which came to be known as the Smart Border Accord. These were designed to put instruments in place that would give both governments more certainty over who and what was coming across the U.S.-Canada border in either direction. It succeeded, but at a cost. Clearly, it is more cumbersome today than it was before 9-11 to cross that border. As a result, the bonds that united millions of citizens in our respective countries are looser today, slightly at least, than they had been previously. And the potential to achieve further economic integration has somewhat been compromised. The Christian government quickly accepted George W. Bush administration's request that we join the coalition in Afghanistan. Our fighting role ended just last summer, after almost a decade during which we were principally responsible for the coalition's position in Kandahar province in the southeast on the Pakistani border, where we suffered uh, for the entire uh, coalition membership a disproportionate share of military deaths. We remain in Afghanistan as trainers of the Afghan National Army. By contrast, we declined President Bush's invitation to join the coalition of the willing in Iraq. And in one of the worst managed announcements of a policy position certain to irritate the United States, Paul Martin, Prime Minister Kretzian's successor from 19, 2004 to 2006, told the House of Commons in 2005, without giving the U.S. a heads up, that Canada would not participate in the U.S. missile defense program. The relationship became pretty frosty uh, from that point until Martin's Liberal government was defeated in May of 2006 by Stephen Harper's Conservatives. And it wasn't just at the level of the presidency that we encountered problems as a result. A distinguished former Canadian diplomat and academic John Holmes wrote in his 1981 book, Life with Uncle, the Canadian-American Relationship, mm -hmm. that, quote, Canada, the good ally, got more generous treatment in Congress than a Canada regarded as too friendly with Castro and Mao. Having arrived in Washington for my second tour there uh, at the embassy just months after the Harper government came to office in 2006, I can personally attest that members of Congress had an acute sense, my role principally was our relationship with Congress, I was responsible for our relationship with Congress, I was not responsible for Congress. Um, I can personally attest that the members of Congress that I came into contact with had an acute sense that the new Canadian government was not trying to score domestic political points off of the United States. They may not have known much else about Canada, but they felt they knew that. And they seemed to think that this represented a dramatic change in behavior on Canada's part. An efficiently operating border that achieves both countries' security needs has been Prime Minister Harper's greatest bilateral preoccupation since coming to office in 2006. We didn't oppose the Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, your passport requirement, but we did press hard for it to be implemented only after a critical mass of Canadians and Americans had passports or other acceptable identity documents. The Bush administration opposed any delay whatsoever. If asked to identify the single greatest triumph of my most recent posting in Washington, it unquestionably would be our success in persuading Congress in the face of administration opposition to set the WHTI implementation date back by 18 months. A year ago, Prime Minister Harper, a year ago this month, Prime Minister Harper and President Obama launched in Washington at the White House a Beyond the Border Accord process. Their objective, to find ways through technology and information sharing to push scrutiny away from the actual border to the extent possible. Both countries would like to do more scrutiny at the perimeter, i.e. before visitors or cargo enter North America, creating scope for greater ease of movement between our countries at the actual physical border itself. And we're both committed to achieving a greater degree of regulatory harmonization, thereby eliminating some of the time-consuming complications that confront commerce. Just over two months ago, again at the White House, the President and Prime Minister released their detailed action plans 
to drive this vision toward reality. They are impressive, the plans are, in their comprehensiveness, with both our governments having identified many significant improvements that can be achieved over the next couple of years, in fact, by precise date of deliverable. This is, or at least should be, as important to the United States as it is to us. Canada is the principal export destination for Indiana, for 34 other states, and for the United States as a whole. As uh, was pointed out in the introduction, Indiana sells more goods to Canada than to its next seven foreign markets combined. Remarkably, the 34 million of us, we Canadians, buy more from the United States than the 500 plus million residents of the 27 European Union countries do. More remarkably still, perhaps, the so-called BRIC countries, about which there's a great deal of interest and fascination, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, combined population 2.7 billion, sell more to the two provinces of Canada, Ontario and Quebec, population 21 million, than they do to the four BRIC countries, population 2.7 billion. 8 million U.S. jobs depend on trade with Canada, over 160,000, in fact, 162,300 in the state of Indiana. But the world's largest two-way trade relationship needs constant tending if it's to continue to grow. Tending extends to firm action to remove unnecessary impediments. Infrastructure is one of the critical contributors to such improvement. This has a regional context. Canada's number one national infrastructure priority is a new crossing of the Detroit River at Windsor. This is an audience I've now talked about to audiences across Michigan, Ohio, and even here in Indiana. Perhaps somebody will want to raise it during the question period that's coming right up. Suffice it to say that we hope that Michigan's leaders will soon find a way to make this bridge happen. At his State of the State speech last month, Governor Snyder of Michigan reiterated his personal commitment to getting it done, properly emphasizing the jobs that it will create and the fact that Canada will bear all of the cost and all of the liability. With so many millions of jobs in both of our countries, relying on everything working just right every day at the 83-year-old Ambassador Bridge, the employment risks associated with having no alternative no option at Detroit Windsor are simply too great to permit continued inaction. This is important to Indiana since approximately half of your trade with Canada crosses the Ambassador Bridge, meaning 100,000 or more Hoosiers depend for their livelihood on having a bridge there at Detroit Windsor that will work well and well into the future. Energy and the environment are also huge priorities for Canada. We discovered after the Kyoto Protocol was fashioned in 1997 that two countries sharing a continent with heavily integrated economies who are one another's best customers cannot pursue significantly divergent policies on climate change. We're also committed, consistent with NAFTA's energy chapter, to North American energy integration and, if possible, North American energy self-sufficiency. Guaranteed access to Canadian energy supplies was one of the USA's principal NAFTA objectives. In discharge of that commitment, you got what you were looking for in that negotiation. In discharge of that commitment, we've proceeded to develop our reserves, which in the case of oil, happened to be the third largest in the world after Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. In the process, we've become the USA's largest supplier of imported oil, natural gas, electricity, and uranium. We are proximate, reliable, and like-minded. The energy is privately developed, not subject to the capricious treatment that the government-owned supplies in most OPEC countries suffer. I put over here uh, a sheet on the Canada-Indiana trade relationship and a copy of an op-ed that uh, your Fort Wayne Journal-Gazette ran on 26th of September of last year on the subject of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline. I'm sure you all read it at the time, but if you've forgotten its content or want to refresh your memories, there are copies there for the taking. Still, the signals that we're getting from the U.S. administration, particularly regarding the pipeline, but maybe more generally regarding Canadian energy development are not altogether encouraging. 
Um, a Canadian firm, uh, TransCanada Pipelines, had proposed to build a pipeline called Keystone XL uh, in the United States, or at least 1,700 miles from central Alberta to the U.S. Gulf Coast, uh, a Canadian investment of, a private sector Canadian investment of $7 billion in the U.S. that would create 20,000 jobs in the U.S. over the two-year construction period. Um, that application was before the U.S. State Department for three years. It was rejected at least for the moment, earlier this year, we're still hopeful that the project ultimately will proceed, but we can't help arriving at the conclusion that it would be prudent for us to look at alternative energy markets. The Prime Minister in that regard visited China two weeks ago. Their interest in accessing Canadian oil was definitely a major subject of discussion during that meeting. Over the course of this presentation I've described in some considerable detail, as well as from 30,000 feet, uh, a 235-year-long symbiotic relationship between two countries sharing responsibility for making a massive continent work to mutual advantage. While the USA's relationship with every country is unique, it can safely be said, I think, that both qualitatively and quantitatively, with no country is the USA's relationship as remotely sophisticated as it is with Canada. Obviously, relations between the two of us aren't domestic. We're both sovereign countries. So the term intermestic has cleverly been coined specifically to define or describe the U.S.-Canada relationship. 89 U.S. counties in 14 states share a border with Canada, meaning that more than one quarter of U.S. senators and governors have an acute, often constituent-driven interest in the details of the relationship. This means many things, among them that conducting the relationship is by no means the preserve of so-called foreign policy professionals. Bottom line, we all have a role to play. But as one of those professionals, I can honestly say that I can imagine nothing more rewarding than spending one's career continuously engaged in trying to improve relations between our two great countries, which is why I've chosen to do just that and have opted rather peculiarly to spend my career in the Foreign Service only serving in places I could drive to instead of, instead of in more exotic climes which might be more interesting and satisfying in some respects but unquestionably would be much less relevant uh, to Canadian interests and therefore much less interest to me. Thanks for your attentiveness. You've been great. Um, I'm prepared to take questions for as long as you are willing to ask them um, because all I'm doing now is driving to Bloomington. I, I, I suggest that if Keystone doesn't go through, that can, the Canadians uh, and Canada will be less obsessed with, with the U.S. Um, the media is here. You're not the foreign minister. Uh, I did research on this. I didn't read all of the articles for the last year in The, in the Economist magazine. Uh, but what I thought was interesting was uh, Transparency.org described Canada as being the least corrupt country in the Americas, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I defer comment on the Vienna at this point, but why might that be the case? Well, sir, uh, you mm -hmm. know, I, I, I give it to you straight. You know, I, if we were having a private conversation, you know, I would say more. But mm -hmm. why might Canada, I suspect that is the case, that Canada is, is the least corrupt country and the Western Hemisphere. Why might that be the case? Is small government uh, better? Uh, certainly well, we, we don't have small government, necessarily. Uh, we have... We it's have less government than what the states have, isn't it? I don't know. Um, in, in, terms of, in terms of proportion of GDP spent by government, uh, we're probably marginally higher, in part because we have a national health care system. Um, I, 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 I probably would best not discuss the national health care system, given the controversy that associates with your attempt to acquire a national health care system. Um, one, um, one uh, well, it, it's better in some respects. It's better in terms of the provision of primary care. Um, we live longer. We don't live longer because we live in the colder part of the continent, that's for sure. Um, we live longer because um, people who, uh, uh, from birth, get, I mean, there are fewer uh, infant, less infant mortality in Canada. Uh, we spend more money, if you like, at the earlier part of life and proportionately less at the later part of life. Um, in terms of the corruption, I, I sort of chuckled when you mentioned Indiana. I, I don't 
perceive Indiana as as corrupt, but maybe I haven't spent as much time as I as I should in the company of Professor Downs, and he could tell me more. Um, I do perceive I do perceive um, uh, some corruption in. Michigan politics, I'll be candid, even in front of, uh, of the media, uh, in as much as, as the bridge that I was talking about would have been built, uh, but for the fact, corruption may be a big word, but, but for the fact that an awful lot of legislators uh, have been persuaded through, it would seem in part through generous campaign contributions by the monopolist owner of the existing bridge, who doesn't want any competition, uh, that they should uh, oppose the construction of a new bridge, even though it won't cost Michigan anything. And Michiganders have been subjected to a multi-million dollar advertising campaign telling outright lies to Michiganders about the nature of the project. That said, um, in terms of why we uh, might um, uh, be a model of some sorts uh, in the hemisphere. Um, dare I say, uh, reasonably strict limits on campaign financing uh, might be one of those. Um, um, we provide public financing to candidates for office, uh, parties and individual candidates. We have no First Amendment to our Constitution. Um, uh, we have no Citizens United uh, decision by uh, our Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, candidates and parties can spend only so much money. Um, and outside parties have trouble spending money as well. And to the extent to which money is a contributor, perhaps, to the condition that you're describing, the absence of it may actually make Canadian politics more predictably clean. I don't know. Um, um, we don't, as I said, we do a lot of comparing and contrasting as Canadians. We don't proselytize within the United States to try to promote any particular model, whether it's health care or campaign financing. You have your system. You make it work for you. We watch it. Uh, we're fascinated by it. Um, we borrow a lot of your techniques. Um, there's usually about a five-year delay before anything that really seems to work effectively in U.S. politics being imported into Canada. Some of it can't be imported because it simply would cost too much money and blow the budget. But those things that, uh, that do lend themselves to copying invariably get, um, get uh, borrowed and copied in Canada. Um, you began on the pipeline and then we kind of got diverted. Um, well, uh, if you've got, if oil's important and yeah. increasingly will be, uh, I, and uh, if the U.S. doesn't want to play ball, then that makes the, perhaps a uh, relationship with China uh, much more important to you, the Canadian, to Canada, and, uh, and, and, the, and the U.S. Uh, less important. Uh, an antithesis to the, your speech, sir. It'll never, I can't imagine it ever becoming more important than the relationship with the U.S. just because of the fact that we share geography with the U.S. and we don't with China. Agreed. But but the Chinese relationship will, in relative terms, become more important than it has been. I think that yes. goes without saying. Um, we still, uh, we, we essentially sell no oil to China. We export 99% of our oil to the United States. Uh, we've developed the oil predicated again on that model. We would like, it makes more sense environmentally, actually, to sell it to the United States. If you, have a, if you consider a global market for energy, uh, pipelines are the most energy efficient as well as the most environmentally sound way of transporting oil to market relative to ships across the Pacific to China. We'll sell it to China. We're determined to build a pipeline to the West Coast so as to give ourselves that capacity. The Prime Minister of Canada uh, has, has taken to saying that Canada is an emerging energy superpower. Some people have said to him, or in response to that statement, you can't be a superpower if you have only one market uh, as, a, as a producer or supplier. And maybe the answer is to ensure that we can service more markets. We're hopeful that, that what we regard, frankly, as common sense will prevail in the end and that the pipeline in question will be approved. And we think that will happen um, not just, maybe even not principally, for the jobs benefits, although 
the jobs benefits of the pipeline, I said 20,000 jobs, thanks for coming. The jobs benefits of the pipeline are significant. The jobs benefits of the overall energy development in the Alberta oil sands to the United States are more significant still. 60 cents of every dollar invested in energy development in the, pipe, in the, in the oil sands comes back to the United States. Vastly more than is the case for any energy development by American companies, and much of this is done by American companies, um, anywhere else in the world, except of course in the United States itself. Because we overwhelmingly source American equipment, technology, and services to engage in, in that production. And so the 160 billion, 160 billion dollars of private sector investment, much of it American, currently being invested in the oil sands to take production from 2 million barrels a day to 3.5 million barrels a day will create over the next four or five years 340,000 jobs in the United States. 7,600 of those using standard economic modeling in Indiana. There's no play anywhere, there's no project in North America in any sector that is remotely as large as that one or will have remotely as large an employment generating impact. But that isn't even the principal reason why this is attractive to you. This is from our um, uh, disinterested uh, Canadian perspective. It is of interest to you for the same geostrategic reasons that underpin the NAFTA energy chapter. We can go to five million barrels. The difference between two and five is three. Iran sells three million barrels of oil a day into the global market. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to say to Iran, keep your oil? As in, right now, ever since 1979, you, we, all of us, have sort of held ourselves hostage to Iran. Does anybody think this is going to stop anytime soon, that these games are going to stop being played? We worry about the potential impact of sanctioning Iranian oil on global market and energy prices. We're seeing gasoline prices go up at the pump now. They're going up at the pump now precisely because there is a worry that the three million barrels of oil per day that Iran provides into the global marketplace might no longer be accessible. What if Canada could provide the three million barrels per day? We can't do it tomorrow. We can't do it even three years from now. But we might be able to do it six or seven years from now. And again, if you anticipate this replaying. So we would give ourselves geostrategic freedom, as it were. Tom Friedman, New York Times columnist, writes periodically, he uses the term that the United States finances both sides in the war on terror, meaning the United States sends its funds to the Middle East, and then it sends its military to the Middle East to be able to contain the impacts of how those funds might be spent with nefarious purposes, uh, intentions that are deleterious to U.S. interests. Um, you do not have to worry about this with Canada. We are friends. We don't engage in activities that um, are fundamentally different in any way from those of the United States. So I think from a geostrategic perspective, it just makes sense. Your senior U.S. senator, we don't get involved in U.S. politics, but I've gotten to know your senior U.S. senator from Indiana quite well, um, worked with him in Washington and his staff. It seemed to me when I was in Washington that if there was anybody, and he's consistent on the subject, if there was anybody who got the true potential benefits to North America of energy self-sufficiency in geostrategic terms and what that meant in terms of freeing up U.S. foreign policy vulnerability, it was Dick Lugar. And you know, he's been consistent, he's outspoken on the subject, and um, you know, in our view, he gets it. Um, we're very grateful to him for his leadership on the subject. He's not alone. Senator Coates has spoken up. Uh, Representative Stutzman from, from uh, this district has spoken up. Most of the members of Congress of the House from Indiana have spoken up. Governor Daniels has done so. The Senate, uh, the Indiana State Senate last year passed in a bipartisan majority Resolution 54 endorsing both the oil sands and KXL. In other words, middle America is speaking, I think, and we're hopeful that ultimately uh, that, that voice, uh, that expression of voice will be heard um, in Washington uh, and that um, after this year is through, 
uh, there will be a positive decision and we can supply more to the U.S. and we can supply, um, you know, I talked about Iran. The 800,000 barrels of oil per day that would come through the Keystone XL pipeline is exactly the quantity that the United States imports annually from, Ven or daily from Venezuela. Interesting. Um, last year, U.S. consumers sent $30 billion to Hugo Chavez, essentially because it's a government owned and operated enterprise. And last year, Hugo Chavez was sending funds to Muammar Gaddafi to repel the rebels in Libya while uh, US, Canadian, French, British planes were trying to uh, contain Gaddafi, both sides in the war on terror. Um, we could tell Chavez to keep his oil if you want it. And that is why we think that it is in the United States' geostrategic interest to find Canadian energy development attractive and to opt for it, completely apart from the jobs, and yet the jobs are, are significant. <laughs>